Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Pakistan. Uh, thank you for watching my program. This is Hadi Mehdi. This program is in English because it is entirely focused on the Palestinians' uh, right for self-determination and freedom. And uh, to welcome my guest, none other than the great Mr. Eric Margolis. Mr. Margolis, welcome to the program, sir. Thank you. It's good to be back with you. Thank you very much, sir. Very kind of you for taking the time out to be with us. Uh, Mr. Margolis, I'm really going to go straight into the program because uh, one of the most fascinating things about you and your book, American Raj, is I mean, I'm sharing this blurb, which you put in the front of your book. And while it covers the entire globe and uh, everything about the American Raj, you say Israel's repression of the Palestinian Intifada is being telecast around the globe, producing rage against Israel and its patron, the United States, and a worldwide surge of anti-Semitism. America's strategic and economic interests in the Middle East and Muslim world are being threatened by the agony in Palestine, which inevitably invites terrorist attacks against U.S. citizens and property. What is most remarkable about this, Mr. Margolis, is that you published this on September 2nd, 2001 in the Sun Media, nine days before the September 11 attacks uh, against New York and Washington. That is a remarkable piece of prescience. What prompted you to put this in the front of your book? Well, uh, the, the, the terror, the agony of Palestine was still very much in the center of my mind. I've been involved with it since I was a child, literally. And uh, things are getting worse than in the whole anti-terrorism campaign. It was in full trot. And uh, it was just a tragedy that was unfolding in front of our eyes. Hmm. And, and, you know, the other remarkable book in this book, a, a, a remarkable thing in this book is I was reading your prologue and, and, and you talk about a paper that your mother had written in 1953, as far back as that. And, and she wrote a study which says the gauge of Arab anger, she said, she predicted that until and unless the Palestinian refugee problem is not solved in a fair humanitarian way, in 50 years, she predicted with remarkable foresight the entire Arab and much of the Muslim world would turn violently against the United States. What an uncannily accurate prediction. She did. So you have it in the... So the report was prepared for the State Department too, which received it, read it, and did nothing about it. Hmm. Hmm. So, so you have it in your genes. So, uh, uh, Eric, I'm trying to do it in two parts. One is with kind of the, the, the background context to what's happening and then the current situation. And uh, some of, most of what I'm going to be sharing as context is from your book. And, you know, it really starts with Goldemir saying that there is no such thing as a Palestinian, whereas 850,000 were, were expelled from there. <laughs> Kuwait, by the way, subsequently in decades later, expelled nearly half as much from their own, own state. Seven to nine million have been displaced around the world. Why wasn't there a Jewish state in Europe when the Holocaust uh, took place in Germany? Well, because uh, nobody wanted a Jewish state. Uh, maybe the British, but in somebody else's country, in Kenya or somewhere else in Africa. Uh, and uh, Jews were not wanted in Europe. They were not wanted in the United States and Canada either. They were turned away as they were desperately seeking refu refuge here from growing anti-Jewish sentiments, not only in Germany, but across all of Eastern Europe. And, 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 and hence, when this uh, Palestinian, uh, I would say, kind of a Palestinian Holocaust commenced in 1948, one of the significant aspects that we've seen over the years has really been their, the treachery committed on them, not just by, by Israel and, and the U.S., as many would claim, but also by their Muslim brothers in Jordan, in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, in Tunisia, and Morocco, and Turkey. You've written about this. Uh, what do you make of this? Well, as a, as a friend of, of the Muslim world, I am particularly upset uh, by the treacherous behavior of the Muslim country towards the Palestinians. Uh, I've often said in Islamic conferences and meetings that if uh, Jews were being 
killed and uh, tortured and women raped as they were in Bosnia at the time, uh, that the Israelis would have been, the Israeli army would have come in and rescued them. And yet we had the horrors in Bosnia to just one case. And in the Muslim world, aside from Iran, uh, did absolutely nothing. And even the great Turkish army uh, did watch this, this atrocity without any action. And, and this really uh, just shows the state of, 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 of the Muslim world, how they have uh, shown their spitelessness, their absolute uh, a lack of any morality and ethics and, and, and strength to be able to counter this. And yet uh, you do say in your book that till 1990, you never encountered a significant anti-Semitism in the Muslim world. So what happened? Never. Uh, it, you, I encountered it in Europe and in Britain in particular and in the United States, but never in the, in the Middle East, East or the Muslim world, uh, Jews were referred to as the cousins. Uh, there wasn't this, this seething animosity, but with, as the persecution uh, of the Palestinian people had grown worse, of course, uh, a sense of anti-Semitism has spread it everywhere. We're seeing it even this week. I just came back from Paris and uh, you see it in the streets there. People are angry. And, they, and they're taking it out, and they're blaming it on the Jewish people. So, so this, this anti-Semitism uh, has, has risen really as a consequence of the Palestinians. And, and what you've actually said uh, is something remarkable, that there is a block of uh, perhaps as high as 40% of Christian Zionists in, in the USA, which have given rise to this massive poor Israeli uh, policy that the US administrations have commenced. And what is, what is behind this uh, rise of Christian Zionists? Uh, largely ignorance. Uh, these uh, so-called Christian Zionist fundamentalism are uh, concentrated in what we in America call the Bible Belt, which is the Midwest and the South. These are people who are do not have much education. They get a lot of their information from Christian news networks. Uh, they read Christian books, all of which are very anti-Muslim, are usually full of baloney and erroneous statements. And they... Uh, the Israelis were very clever. I saw this in person happening during the 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon. I was, with, as a journalist, with the covering the Israeli army. And the Israelis went into Lebanon. They found these Lebanese Christians who hated Muslims and they called, them, called themselves Phoenicians. Uh, and they teamed up with them and these, these evangelical Christians thinking they could take people away from Islam, uh, set up radio stations in Lebanon. And fast forward today, uh, there is a very strong Christian evangelical effort in the United States uh, to try and undermine Islam and also to, uh, pr to, pr to promote Israel, uh, these people tend to believe that Israel is the sec second coming and the Messiah and all the stuff that Bi the Bible says. And, and this is interesting you say that because the, the pre-Second World War slogan, uh, which was from the Nile to the Euphrates, you know, which was pr propounded by by the Jewish and the Zionists, took another shape from the into the Palestinian slogan, from the river to the sea. So how, how does one address these two slogans? Well, I can tell you the first one, from the Nile to the Euphrates, is starting to come true. Uh, Egypt has uh, become a colony, practically, of the United States. It, it's, its money is uh, okayed by the Israel lobby, 
Uh, so Israel has a very strong hold over the Egyptian dictatorship, General El Sisi, a nasty place, I could tell you, one of the world's worst dictatorships. And uh, that takes us to the Nile. Uh, they're always at the Euphrates with the Iraq falling apart, largely destroyed by the United States. So there is some merit in that old slogan. As for the Palestinians, they're getting nowhere right now. In fact, I think they're going backwards. And and that's interesting you say that about the Palestinians. Uh, one of your our major uh, narratives is that the Palestinians have lost the media war in uh, the U.S. and the Western capitals because of the imagery that comes out. And, and partly you also allege that uh, Israeli false flag operations over the decades have contributed to that. What do you have to say about that, sir? Well, the Israelis are, have done a, uh, a brilliant job in promoting their cause, and they uh, they never miss an instance to do so at many different levels. Uh, they dominate the U.S. and British Canadian media. Uh, I used to work for with the largest newspaper chain. In Canada, for example, and they, uh, the, the people who started the newspaper chain, they, the, the financiers, uh, their rule number one is there must never be criticism of Israel. Uh, so the Israelis have been very clever. They know how to work the media. And uh, the Arabs, disunited and, and often silly or violent, just made a, a, a terrible example of themselves. And the Israelis were very clever in creating this whole notion of terrorism. Uh, and it is a brilliant way of uh, taking a legitimate, somebody with legitimate political problem or uh, ambition and delegitimizing instead by calling it terrorism. Terrorism, terrorism. And it works. And Every American politician, every broadcast on CNN, uh, for example, always refers to Palestinian or Arab terrorism. So, uh, and and uh, how much of this had to do with uh, with the Israeli false flag uh, operations, as you've written in your book? Well, it has a, a lot, but the Israelis are, are brilliant at staging false flag operations. That is doing something that by making the rest of the world think it was somebody else who did it. Um, the Israelis uh, have the benefit of having uh, learned the techniques of the Soviet KGB. Remember, there are a million Russians in Israel and uh, there are poison factories, their intelligence operations, their military tactics. A lot of that is influenced by Russia's experience. So uh, they, and the Israelis are very clever people. I mean, they run rings around most of the Arabs. And uh, I must say Pakistan too. Uh, the Israeli, and the Israelis of course dominate America. I was just writing an article uh, on the current events where uh, Pat Buchanan, uh, who was the speechwriter of President Nixon, very bright man, uh, he called Capitol Hill, this is where the U.S. Congress is located, Capitol Hill called Israeli-occupied territory, and that and the West Bank, uh, <laughs> and it's true. That, that is so interesting. But talking of uh, Israeli techniques and from learn from the Russians, uh, you also make a case that that a lot of the Israeli torture techniques that they uh, employed against the Palestinians were then picked up by the U.S. forces in Afghanistan and Iraq, and uh, what you we saw in Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib was really training done by Israelis to American armed forces on how to torture uh, these prisoners and get information out of that. Yes, how to break the morale of Muslims, uh, to dishonor them, to shame them. Uh, it, I'm very embarrassed that the United States 
picked up all these awful techniques that were learned, but they have, and the, the U.S. Uh, in, military and, in, and increasingly intelligence services are dominated by Israel. And uh, I, I remember came, I went to the Pentagon to give a briefing to the chiefs of staff of the Air Force, and I was surprised to see that uh, there were senior Israeli officers right there in the Pentagon in the office. So uh, the Israelis have, they have one, one objective in mind, and that is to promote the interests of Israel, and they've got the America behind them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also really interesting that, um, according to you and many other uh, very uh, objective analysts and observers say that nearly 50% of Israelis are pro-peace, and yet they have been sidelined. How has Israel been able to do that? Uh, extremists always get ahead of people who are promoting peace. Um, and there is a strong pro peace movement in Israel, which I admire greatly. There's some very brave Israelis who are willing to stand up and face the uh, expansionist Zionist group. Uh, my one of the leading figures was a, an Israeli newspaper columnist, columnist named Uri Avneri, a very brave, brilliant man. Uh, yes, and he called the current the people who are now in charge of the current coalition government in Israel as Jewish fascists. Wow, and, uh, and that is a term that's used in Israel very often. No one would dare use it in the United States or the foreign press, but it has a certain resonance. Hmm. So uh, coming to the present, and and uh, then we'll wind up, sir. Um, Hamas refuses to recognize Israel. Uh, Hezbollah refuses to recognize Israel. What drives this uh, absence of recognition of Israel as a state by these two entities and Iran? It's the sense that a great injustice was done to the Muslim people, that they're being forced at gunpoint to bend the knee and uh, make concessions, but also the idea that uh, they are uh, saving recognition uh, as a last bargaining element in the field, in the final in the peace whenever it comes uh, that they win. And let's not forget that the uh, heroic Afghan resistance, uh, which fought for 20 years, uh, against the world's greatest military power, managed to, to refused to bend the knee and accept and accept any kind of peace stuff being shoved down their throats, and they won in spite of everything. So the Palestinians think they have a chance. They're not Afghans, but you never know. Uh, that's interesting, sir. Uh, currently, what we're seeing is about 11,000 Palestinians killed, half of them children, uh, women. Uh, there is a, a four-hour window that, that the Israelis have offered to get people to move out. There's, uh, there's water, sewage, contamination, diarrhea, one child being killed every four minutes. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees calls this genocide and has called for immediate uh, ceasefire. The Deputy Prime Minister of Belgium has called for sanctions against Israel. 20 hostages have been killed. 300 Ukrainian academics have, have called for, for uh, sanctions against Israel. How do you see this playing out in the international scenario, sir? Well, I've seen it. Uh, I've seen such scenarios over and over again since I was a child. And the usual procedure is that the, you, when you get close to American elections, the Israelis feel they can get away with anything. It's probably true. They, uh, then they go and they do what they want to do. And uh, once they've achieved most of it, uh, they then suddenly start listening to Americans screaming because America's worried uh, that it has all of its interests across the Muslim world. Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, etc., which are threatened by this calamity 
in Palestine, and they and the Arabs maybe get really angry one day and start shooting off bombs and attacking American air bases. So it's uh, it, it's significant, but the Israelis uh, usually go up to the eleventh hour before they make any kind of concessions. Eventually, this whole drama will end. Maybe when the last Palestinians have been killed, or the last buildings blown up. Uh, but there will be some kind of peace settlement. And I know that America's inept Secretary of State uh, is just mentioned that they are talking about bringing uh, um, uh, Abbas's PLO to run the Gaza Strip. And if there was an, um, any more inept, corrupt puppet organization than that, than the PLO, I don't know of it. So peace will come, or peace, not the, not peace. You know, I'm reminded of the statement of the, of the great Roman historian Tacitus, who said uh, of the Roman wars, he said, they, they make a desert and call it peace. Mm. So uh, from a military standpoint, of the preponderance of Israeli military might is huge. And we may see some kind of a lessening of the military conflict. Do you think there is a possibility that the Hezbollah uh, and, uh, uh, will open up a northern front and we may see some kind of Iranian involvement in this uh, conflict? I don't think so. The Iranians are very smart and uh, they... Uh, have so far avoided any direct involvement. The Israelis would like to attack Iran. The Americans would like to attack Iran. The Israel lobby in the United States would be thrilled to attack Iran. But so far, we don't think it's happening. It still could. It's a very volatile situation. War could erupt very easily by a misadventure, a plane being shot down, a plane worship hitting a mine, something like that. Uh, but uh, Iran, I think, is, is knows that it will be defeated. It'll be bombed back to the Stone Age, literally. I remember Pakistan's uh, former military dictator, Muhammad uh, Musharraf, Musharraf said, told me, he said, when the Americans decided they wanted to invade Afghanistan, they went to the Pakistanis and they said, uh, you know, let us in, open up your air bases and ports to us or else. And the or, or else, according to Musharraf, was that they will bomb Pakistan back to the Stone Age. The U.S. Mm. has the B-52 bombers to do that. Last question, uh, Mr. Mario. The, the, the predictor in you, the crystal ball, uh, Eric, Five years from now, how do you see the Middle East, the Palestinian issue, and the Arab world? With not much positive thought, I'm, I, I'm sad to say. Uh, it's a part of the world very dear to my heart, but I would like to think a bit of it. The only thing I can hope for is that all this violence and chaos in Palestine and the heart of the Middle East will somehow lead to the overthrow of the Arab dictatorships that are ruining, holding back the entire Arab world. Uh, but I look at Egypt and uh, I, Morocco and countries like that, they're so backwards that uh, they're going to need a major revolution to change things. And we include Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. Do, do you see a one state where Jews and Palestinians live together in peace? Um, we we could. Canada is a good example of that, where everybody more or less gets along. Uh, but um, you, when your land has been taken away, when your property has been stolen, it's very hard to be peace-minded, and it's not going to come soon, and it's easily disrupted by violent extremists. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Eric Margolis. What a pleasure to always uh, uh, talk to you. The prescience that you they offer is just remarkable. Uh, may God bless you, keep you in good health, you, your Thank family. You.
May God keep everyone safe and sound, Palestinians, every peace-loving person in the world. May those who are suffering, may he bring them peace. May those who have died, may find bless, bless, may they find blessings in the hereafter. And uh, wishing you and everybody a peaceful world. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yes, thank you. Inshallah. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum and Khuda Hafiz. Yes. Assalamu alaikum.